Okay, are you ready for another rambling story about gaming? Because uh, I've been thinking for a long time on a lot of topics to do for Counter Monkey, and so uh, I thought I would go over one of the best campaigns that I ever DM'd, and this was in a game store. It's prox actually, you know, uh, before I went online, it was probably the last campaign around the tabletop I ever DM'd, and it went really well. I'm not saying it, you know, it, I stopped because it went badly. It actually went great. Um, so much so that they kept begging me to go back to it. I had, I had, I got a, finally got a job at like an office. It was a terrible job, but I had to stop DMing up around that point. But uh, it was, it was kind of a D and D game, but not really. The, um, third edition, when when D and D third edition came out, um, it had what's called the open game license, and so it was kind of a trap. Uh, you know, where you it was supposed to be kind of like the open source alternative to gaming, and it really wasn't so much as a, people believed that you could print pretty much anything you wanted as long as you included the open source gaming license at the end of the book. But uh, I believe there was some legal entanglements where you eventually had to kind of pay a license to use it. But there were a lot of spin off games that used the open gaming license at the time. Some really good, others really, really bad. Um, the best one of them that I remember was actually... I might have it here. Where is it? Um, where is it? I'm looking for it now. It's it's called Lone Wolf. Uh, if you remember the... I, I, I probably mentioned this before. The uh, the Lone Wolf RPG based on the based on the Choose Your Own Adventure books. And for the life of me, I can't find it. I could have sworn it was up here. I'm probably looking right at it. But, yeah. Oh, no. Um, I thought I saw it. Oh, well point is that was one of the better ones and almost nobody played it um, another really good one was the wheel of time uh and i wasn't even that big a fan of the novels but the wheel of time the uh, the magic system with the Aes Sedai was actually very complex and at the same time very clever really liked that one i never got a chance to play it especially since there was only one published uh series of adventures for it prophecies of the dragon or something like that it, it I'll, I'll probably do another episode on this very soon, but there, there is kind of a problem with running a campaign inside an established movie, TV, or or novel series because, you know, it, it's kind of like Star Wars. Like I said, um, if in Star Wars, it's you're kind of married to the uh, to the main characters so that you can't actually run into them, otherwise continuity is all sorts of fucked. And so uh, there was a Babylon Five RPG which I actually very much hated, but the the campaign, the fluff was very good, the crunch not so much. But, uh, yeah, Babylon 5, you, you have this problem where, you know, you've, the star characters are the command crew, and so what do you do? Same thing with kind of the uh, the Wheel of Time. You know, there's there's the core main characters, and it's really all about Randall Thor, and you can't really do that. Anyway, the game I'm talking about is... Where's a good book? Uh, Thieves' World. And this is going to take some explanation. Uh, Thieves' World was published by Green Ronin Publishing, and it's based on a series of anthology novels called Thieves' World. And what that means is it was kind of like a... You don't see this much anymore. It, it was an open world, so so much as, you know, these authors create this world, and they basically would allow any other authors to write in that world with, you know, with editorial approval. But, you know, you've got this common pool of characters and a common setting, and other fantasy and sci-fi authors would kind of write their own adventures with their own characters, but also using the shared characters. Almost like a almost like a comic book sort of like you know how Batman has his own established universe and you know authorized writers can use Batman and the Batman characters it's kind of like that with Thieves World and so Green Ronin published three or four source books I pretty much have all of them Oreo um, and you know one of them is just the player's book one of them is the campaign setting uh, a map book and a couple of adventure books ironically enough the adventure books I never used I basically used them for the maps. So I have to explain Thieves' World so you know uh, the stories I'm talking about. So here's the thing with Thieves' World. It's kind of a... I almost don't want to call it a low magic setting, although magic is a very prevalent force in Thieves' World, but it's really not accessible to people on the street, if you know what I mean. It's almost like uh, in Conan. You, would, you might call Conan a very low magic setting, but it's also very powerful. But at the same time, magic is very... Uh, it's not the sort of thing like in, in normal D&D where a mage can go, you know, expecto Patronus and throw out a spell. It's not that fast. Magic in Thieves' World and in Conan is the sort of thing that requires a lot of preparation. A lot of people chanting around a circle. A lot of, like, hours and hours of ritualistic preparation. You know, killing a goat and draining its blood, drawing pentagrams on the floor and shit like that. And it's very powerful when it happens. 
And they replicate that in Thieves' World, where you can actually play like a spellcaster, but you kind of have to have stuff prepared way ahead of time. So it's more... When, when you're a mage in Thieves' World, you, you have to plan ahead. You know what I mean? So, uh, much more so than, than in other games. And so, uh, it, I won't say it discourages you from being a spellcaster, it's just that it's sort of the thing like, uh, your magic would consist of, I want it to rain today, and so I would cast a spell, and it takes four hours, and by God, it's gonna rain today. You know, it's, it's that sort of thing where, it, or, you know, I want to call a lightning storm down on a motherfucker. That's a more powerful version of that, so you, you plan out your chart, you put a marker on a map, and then you put candles around a map, and you chant, and, you know, three hours later, certain enough, lightning hits that guy's house. It's that kind of thing where it's very powerful, but methodical. Anyway, you have to know where that's coming from. You have to know the differences between that and D&D. To explain Thieves' World, it's not so much a world. Actually, that was my big problem with, with the, set, the setting name, is it's not so much Thieves' World as it is Thieves' City. Uh, Thieves' World is based almost entirely around the city of Sanctuary, which is the fantasy equivalent, I would almost say, of um, of Ankh Morpork. Kind of a not well. That's that's actually too big. Um, I almost want to say Moss Eisley, but it's bigger than that. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good equivalent. Sanctuary is Sanctuary, where it's a very large uh, trading city that kind of went from obscurity into basically a trading boomtown. Um, it used to be part of a very large empire, and the story is. That empire, the Ilsig Empire, I believe it was, is conquered by another empire called the Rankin Empire. So it's in this weird transitional state in history where Sanctuary belonged to one empire and then that empire was conquered by another empire. And so basically Sanctuary is being occupied by the Rankin Empire. And so people are, of course, are are, are somewhat, uh, are very... Uh, disturbed by the, you know, they're, they're very rankled by this idea that they're being occupied by a foreign power, and so the guy in charge of sanctuary, you know, he he is a, he's a foreign, uh, he, I think he's the prince or something like that. I can't remember my knowledge of it is a little shady, but I think he's I think he's the prince of the Rankin Empire, and so you know he's given this impossible task of having to keep law and order in a city that fucking hates everyone there. They're occupying a very hostile populace, and in this case. Uh, the warfare not only existed on the land, you know, between, you know, two armies facing each other when one army beat the other, but also among the gods, because the Ilseg Empire and the Rankins have their own set of gods, and these gods as well fought it out, you know. So you've got the Ilseg gods and the Rankin gods, and they had their own little warfare, and, you know, when the, when the Rankin Empire won, the Rankin gods won as well, and kind of exiled the Ilseg gods out of this world, you know what I mean? So you've got you've got this whole thing where not only the Ilsig lost their empire, but they also lost their entire religion, in essence. So you've also got this thing where people are still very devoutly worshipping their old gods, which literally are not there anymore. But it's prophesied that they will, you know, there's of course prophecies that they will come back and the Rankins will fall and the, the Ilsig gods will come and get their vengeance on the, on the Rankin gods. That sort of thing. So... You've got a lot of it, it's a very it's a very attractive setting, and I really got into it for a long time. Where you've got a lot of you've got a lot of political tensions brewing. You've got a lot of very cool characters. You you know you've got not only the the you've also got this very dark gritty fantasy world where you know everyone's everyone's kind of a cutthroat and everyone's very dark and there's a lot of self interest. Um, the gods themselves, like almost in Conan, where uh, in Conan none of the gods are really what you'd call huggable golden rule type of good gods all the gods are very brutal very dark it, it's hard to find a god that you would call that's equivalent to the judeo-christian love thy neighbor god it's all very all very brutal and very bloody and so you know none of these gods are, are, are what you call happy so you've got you know you've got the political tensions you might have and there's a lot of potential for character development you can have you know, there, there's two sides, basically. You can have people who hold different political values, have loyalty to one or the other or none. You can have people who hold very strongly or not at all to the various faiths. And you can have varying levels of nobility and self-interest. You know, like guys who, you know, the rare people who consider themselves vigilantes or, you know, people who are just out for themselves. Or people who are just very anarchist and, you know, want to tear down the established social order because, seriously, fuck those guys running the city we want our city back and so sanctuary kind of in is in this weird place where 
it's actually now it's kind of torn between two empires, but also really wants to carve out its own identity as kind of a city state. You know, it's it wants to be independent. So there's there's that core there. Very cool setting, and uh, I liked it a lot, especially since it was very different from the the very high powered D and D game that we were used to playing. You know, it it it, it there is that there is no alignments so much as you know good versus evil there's basically survival in this very very hardcore setting and it's much more adult oriented i like that um the magic was way different and i like that um there's a uh, lethality uh, I, I, this is going to sound really bad for me but um it's much more i don't say it is more violence but it the the that's not correct to say um the violence is much more decisive where uh, there's almost no healing in Thieves' Worlds because healing magic and clerics almost don't exist. They do exist, but uh, th there's, no, there's almost no healing magic. And what healing magic there is is also the sort of thing that accelerates healing, but doesn't, is it, it isn't just like a magic band-aid where you're like eight hit points back. You know, If you take a brutal sword wound, it's hard to get healing, and if you do, it's still the sort of thing that you're gonna. It, it fucks you up. It's it's the healing process is very painful. It's not the sort of thing that you can get fixed. And so, you know, medicine, even even common medicine is it's it's almost like very dark ages where even the concept of keeping things clean is not some. You know, leechcraft is is you know huge in in the thieves world, and so even getting wounded, you run the risk of serious septic infection. So you don't want to get into fights that much in Thieves' World, and if you are going to get into a fight, it's the sort of thing that's a very last resort. Uh, because if you get hurt, you might die. You know, so it's it's it, it was a very attractive setting in that regard. And um, the the book series itself was very I would call it uneven. I really got hooked on it. But um, if you read a lot of the stories, you'll really start to uh, hate several of the, you know, one or several of the authors that would sometimes take over the anthology series. Um, one author that I, I really grew to hate, and unfortunately she was one of the most prolific writers in the Thieves World series, was Janet Morris. Mainly because uh, Janet Morris, I, 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 I could be wrong, but I believe that Janet Morris uh, had, a, had a very specific Mary Sue character, and that character was Tempest Thales. And unfortunately, well, actually, it was, it was I actually liked Tempest, but I didn't like how Janet Morris used him. So he was a really cool character, but Janet Morris, Mary sued him. Other other authors would use him very well, I thought. And I'll explain Tempest Thales in a second because he actually he is he's a, cent a central focus of this game. Because I also I liked him at the same time I hated him. So when I did my RPG, I took Tempest Thales and kind of made him into a new beast. So I kind of Mary sued him myself in this campaign. But yeah, I, I really didn't like Janet Morris and. And actually, Janet Morris did a bunch of spin-off books that, uh, you'll not be surprised, exclusively follow Tempest Thales outside of Sanctuary. I, you know, called like Wizard Wall, following his exploits in this war. Um, there, 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 was a, there was a lot of wars going on, and so the prince would send Tempest to, to go fight other wars outside of Sanctuary, kind of maintain the rank and hold on their land and stuff like that. But uh, another reason I like Sanctuary is because it all takes place, almost all of it takes place in one city. Um, so it's that kind of place where you can get very familiar with, it's very low level in this setting where players can get very good at, they get very familiar with the city. It has a very specific, it doesn't change, you know, there's, a, there's a map there and you know where everything is. And so once you get familiar with that, you can kind of plan, you can plan things around that map. You can, you know, there's, there's, there's landmarks, there's, it actually rewards players' knowledge of, the, the the topography of the city and stuff like that and so there's places you want to go and there's places you don't want to go if you get if you're being pursued there's a very specific place where you can disappear for a price but it's also very dangerous you know because there's a lot of pickpockets there so um i get the guys together and this is where i have to be careful mentioning specific names so i'm i'm going to try to change their names to protect the innocent and this isn't necessarily embarrassing to anybody but i'll change the names anyway because i'm i'm not sure they're comfortable with me uh, using their their proper names, so I'll try to change them where I can. I'll try to I'll try to think of names that aren't uh, <laughs> offensive to them, like um, you know, male names from male whatever. So I get these guys together, and I'm like, "How would you like to play Thieves World?" And um, actually, it's w another thing when you're doing a game based on a specific uh, intellectual property, like uh, you know, like like World uh, like Game of Thrones or or Wheel of Time or Thieves World. It really helps a lot of times to have to make sure they're familiar with 
the campaign setting. You know, you can't just throw... If you're playing the Babylon 5 RPG, you pretty much can't throw people into Babylon 5 unless they've seen the show. That was also a problem. I have the uh, the Song of Ice and Fire, the Game of Thrones RPG, but that's one of those games where um, you really don't want to throw players who aren't familiar with at least the first book into that game. And so Thieve World I was a little apprehensive about because you honestly should read at least the first book to know the tone, you know. So I, I get these guys together, and I'm like, I, I really want to play Thieves World. Um, what would you think about that? And I was very fortunate. About half of them had read at least the first book, and one of them knew the books inside and out, which actually was a little intimidating for me. It, it, it's it's kind of a, two, a, a double-edged sword where you want them to be familiar with it, but you don't want them to be obsessive about it to the point where they'll actually be correcting you on, on setting setting materials. It's very annoying when you're DMing a game and, you know, like, say, even say Forgotten Realms, and you throw in a character who's common to the to the setting and you say, well, this guy says this, and the player speaks up and he goes, actually, in this novel, Elminster would never say this because he's actually related to this person or he actually did this in this novel written by Ari Salvatore. And you go, fuck. Um, and you actually have to, really, there's, Really, all you have to do is when um, when somebody says that, you just kind of have to like say, "Look, I know that happened in a novel. I didn't read that novel, so it just what I say goes." You know what I mean? Like we're just taking out of the, I'm just taking out of the out of the book what I'm saying. So you know, I'm sure I'm sure in the book this happened, but let's just roll with what I said. You know, and so. So you want them to be familiar, but not so much where it distracts from anything you say. Because, like I said, my memory is really bad. So, you know, if if something happens to Tempest in one of these books, and they go, well, actually, Tempest would never have done this. And I go, well, he does it here. What I usually do when it comes to conflicts like that, and almost the only way I can think of to run... To, again, I keep going back to Babylon 5, but the best way I found to run Babylon 5 was... I would always say it was alternate universe, where... Basically, the way I ran it was, um, I said, where let's just imagine that the setup here is the same. Like, you've got this station, you've got this, you know, all the people on there are the same. Except, let's say, this is an alternate universe, where we're going to roll these characters, and they're going to be the command staff of Babylon 5. So, instead of, you know, Commander Sinclair, you're playing the commander, and, it, you know... After the pilot episode, you are simply the one in charge. They appointed you, and instead of this, instead of Garibaldi, you are the head of security. And so I kind of did this thing where we said, like, let's at this point just say hypertime happens, and reality skews into this tangent, and now you guys are in charge. And so from this point forward, everything you know about the series is wrong because I am going to change things. Characters might act differently than the way they did in the series because from this point forward. This is spoony continuity, you know what I mean? So, like, you know, uh, Londo might not do this in this continuity. You don't know. You know, Jakar might not act this way in this continuity. Hell, even Morden, the guy, you know, the bad guy from the series. If you run into Morden, he might not necessarily be working for the Shadows. You just don't know. So I had to kind of drill that in their heads to where I, I kind of had to leave motivations up in the air to where it diverged radically from the novels. To, and, and honestly, I kept it pretty close to the TV show. I just said, you know, you can't rely on your knowledge of the TV show to kind of carry you through situations. So even if things are starting to happen like they did in the TV show, you can't act like, you know, I would actually start to punish that. If you started to act like they did in the TV show using foreknowledge, I would punish that. So in Thieves World, and Thieves World was not a big problem because the, the setting is so open and I'm really, I didn't use that many of the, the, of the hardcore established characters. And if I ever did, they were very peripheral. You know, um, so, but Tempest Thales was one of those characters I really had to use because honestly, a lot of Thieves World revolves centrally around Tempest Thales. So, who is Tempest Thales? Well, at his base level, Tempest Thales is. I'm trying to think of a character you would relate to uh, very closely. I would almost say he's Kratos from God of War. That's not entirely accurate. But it's very, it's very close. Let me put it this way. Tempest Thales is one of the prototypical brooding super characters you would see a lot in an anime. You know, the kind of guy who was unbeatable in sword combat. He's got magic powers. He can basically decimate armies by himself. He's that fucking good. And the reason he's that fucking good 
is because he's immortal. And the reason he's immortal is because he's essentially the chosen, um, not avatar, he's the chosen vessel of the, I believe the, uh, the, the, I forget the name of the Rankin God. I could actually probably find it in these books, but um, there's the head God of the Rankin Empire is basically a God of War. And so this God of War a long time ago chose Tempest Thales from another dimension, I think, and then kind of pulled him out of that dimension and said, guess what? You're now my vessel. You are, you know, I've given you, I've given you immortality. I've given you super strength. I've given you the best weapons. You know, you are basically handpicked by me to be my agent on this world. So I'm giving you, you know, I'm giving you the powers of gods among men. You're on this world. And all you have to do is follow my orders. Like you have to act as my agent and you have to basically be this agent of war. You have to spread war. You have to spread chaos. You are me on this world. So... Tempest is this guy, he's this warrior who's all of a sudden given this immortality, given all this power, and the only time he's happy is when he's, you know, he's killing, he's maiming, he's murdering, and, and he's he's basically acting out war. And so that's why he's, that's basically why he's working for the Rankin Empire, is because these guys are warmongers. These guys are steamrolling all the competition. And so he's basically, Tempest is basically given the job of administering justice in Sanctuary. Um, so he's given he's given command of the city guard, um, and he's he's given this task where he has to he's in this very brutal world and he has to a very brutal city, and he has to basically you know maintain order in this city that fucking hates him, and so you can you know Tempest Thales is beatable, but he's basically like if you think of him another good example that's probably more accurate is like if if you ever saw the movie Troy, um, Brad Pitt's character Achilles. He's basically like Achilles, a little more powerful than that, actually. But Achilles was basically, you know, in, in myth and in the in the movie, basically unbeatable. Uh, you know, he's the best swordsman ever. Nobody can take this guy one on one. Hell, I don't think anybody could take this guy ten on one. You know, hundred on one, maybe. He'd still, I, I still probably probably put money on Tempest on that one. But you know, he's. It's rumored that he's indestructible. You know, you can wound him, but you have to touch him first, and you're not going to touch him. So, you know, he's he's that kind of guy where he just everything is boring to him now because he's that fucking good. You know, he he's he's killed millions. You know, he's just fucking slaughtered his way through history, and so he it's to the point where he, you know he kills people, but he's fucking bored because nobody poses a challenge to him anymore, and so he's essentially really fucking bored in his post. You know, he's he's this fucking avatar of war, and he's sworn to serve the the empire. And the guy's like, well, you know, maintain order in this city, bitch, you know. And so Tempest hates this shit. So he's already in a bad mood. So if you fuck with him, he's just going to cut your fucking head off. So uh, I'm trying to think of how else I can describe Tempest Thales. Because like I said, it's very important you understand where this guy's coming from. Um, so you can, as, as you can see, Tempest has the great potential, just from, just from the word go, of being this huge Mary Sue character. Because, you know, he's... he's He's dead sexy, you know, uh, he's he's uh, the best swordsman in the world, he's immortal, so he has all this backstory, he broods constantly, uh, you know, you, you can just go on for hours about how he broods about how good he is, and how nobody understands him, and he's only happy in the thick of combat, you can, you know, it's, it's just, you can go down the anime list of characters that, that talk like that, you know, monologuing all the time to himself. And also, what what I kind of like about Tempest Thales, and what's also very disturbing about him, is that he is definitely not a hero. Um, I would almost hesitate to call him an anti-hero to the point where he's he's a villain, and in the hands of the right author, he's sympathetic, but he's also a wanton murderer. So there's there's he's it's it's a very tight you know a good author can walk that tightrope to where you're interested in him, but he's still absolutely fucking evil. To where almost, you know, he's e he's evil partially by choice, but mostly by circumstance, if, if that makes sense. To where this god is not, all, not... The god he's chosen to be the agent of is not only the god of war, she's also the god of rape. To where one of the only things that makes him happy is to rape people. So there's a lot of times where, like, the only way he can satisfy himself is to violently rape people. Quite a lot, actually. And so you start to really, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're kind of with this guy to the point, and then he starts raping people, and he does this a lot. And so, um, 
Yeah, he, he's kind of a disturbing character, and so just in case you were starting to like this guy, he's also a, a wanton rapist. But it's 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 one of those things where in the hands of the right author, he's kind of forced to do it. I'm not in any way defending this behavior. I'm just saying it it's un Jesus Christ, I'm trying to stick up for this guy and I'm not doing a very good job. Um it's it's kind of it it he's told by God to do it, you know what I mean? So he's if he doesn't do it, he'll lose his powers, you know what I mean? So it's you kind of get it, but it's still his choice to do it because so oh, fuck. anyway, Tempest fails. You've got this character, and Janet Morris really goes overboard with him. But other authors I found really did a good job. And I'm sure I'm going to get hate from fans of Thieves World and Janet Morris. It's just my impression. That's just me. Okay. So I've given you, what, 15 minutes of setup on this? But yeah. So we get these characters, and um, it, it's it's a pretty standard run of characters. We, you, know, we have, you know, we have cutthroats, we have thieves. And um, uh, one of the characters, Matthew, his, his great... Uh, I, again, I'm changing his name. Is I'm calling him Matthew in this case, and so his big thing was he rolled a thief. He rolled like a classic thief character, uh, kind of a. Well, that was, I, I'm trying to describe the thief, but even to this day, I don't know what kind of thief that he rolled was because because his big thing was I, I go okay, what did you roll? He goes, I rolled a thief. I go, I look at his character. I go, oh, okay, whatever. And there's nothing. There was nothing out of place about this one. But every time uh, we asked him to do something, um, he would go. Well, I'm not that kind of thief. So, uh, here's an example. They'd be they'd be looting this guy's house. Let's say they got hired to do a job loot, uh, robbing this guy's house. Okay, so they'd go in there and he the they they'd see the safe on the wall. And so one of the characters would be like, "Hey, Matthew," um, or you know, they'd say his character and they go, "Hey, Matthew, why don't you uh, why don't you go crack that safe? It's got a lock on it. You can do that." Because you know, all, there was only I think one thief really. You know, we had one guy who was an assassin. We had one guy who was a wizard, and we had like a fighter, and so we had a couple other guys. There was also a, there was also a priest of the god of death, um, whatever. So they they'd go, well, why don't you why don't you crack that safe? And he'd go, oh, I, I'm not that kind of thief. And we go, what do you mean? He's like, well, well, I I didn't put any ranks into open lock, and we'd all just kind of look at him and go like, <laughs> so <clears throat> you know, the big hulking fighter would be like. All right, so and the, the, he'd get his crowbar and he'd stick his crowbar and they'd be like, "Wait, why? Oh shit! I, I just thought, why don't you search for traps? I, mean, I can force this thing up. Why don't you search for traps?" And Matthew'd be like, I, "Oh, I'm not that kind of thief either." <laughs> so um, he'd crowbar the shit open. Uh, even I'd be like, "What kind of thief are you? Um, are you like?" We, 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 wanted, we wanted to ask him and he's like I he wouldn't answer you know he was he'd be like I'm just not I just don't do locks I don't I don't break into shit I'm like then you're not a thief fuck it you know so we'd go on we'd break into shit and we, we'd keep asking him over the course of the campaign to like do shit like thieves would do they'd be like oh well um I got an idea we have to get inside this keep you know we have to get inside this manor so why don't you scale the wall and open the gate from the inside he'd be like I I'm not that kind of thief I'm like what do you mean I didn't put any ranks in the climb walls and be like, what do you do? You know, and I, I, to, I, I actually think he, he eventually put ranks in, like, climb walls. So we would ask him to climb shit. He'd be like, I'm really good at that. I, I think what he did was he put all his ranks in, like, fucking tumbling. And he was more the kind of backstabbing Heidi thief. Where he just, he, he was, like, really good at stabbing people. Uh, but he didn't, I think his intelligence was really low. So he didn't have any skill rank. I don't even know. But, like... Everything that you think a thief would do, he's not that kind of thief. It blew my mind. I, this guy, I, I, he, 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 but the funny thing was, he was a good player. He was really solid in every other game, except this one. He, 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 I think he was trying to go for a really iconoclastic thief, where he's like, "I want to do a thief, but I don't want to do a thief like everyone else does." You know, the kind of guy who picks pockets. I, actually, I think that was what he. I think one thing he did was he picked pockets really well, but he never did it. You know, he was one of those guys where, like, he didn't want to get caught, so he never did it. So, like, I think he put all his his ranks in, like, move silently and pickpocket. And, you know, that I, I, I still don't know, because he never, he never, he would, he never revealed what kind of thief he was. I, but, yeah, we, we, we just got so frustrated with the guy, because, like, climb that, I'm not that kind of thief. And so, like, all the classic things you think a thief would do, he just didn't do. Um, so, you know, we kind of had, we, we kind of had our, our brute force. We kind of had the sword, the blade master kind of guy. And we had this wizard. And, um, 
let me think of a good name for this wizard because this this story is really about him. Um, let's call him Martin. So Martin, uh, he's playing a wizard, and as I said, wizards in Thieves' world are are much different from other ones to where they mainly do rituals. They don't do really fast spell casting. So I think the fastest spells that a wizard can do in Thieves' world take at least a minute to prepare to the point where like you have to crack out shit like incense and and burn it and stuff like so eventually he got up and leveled to where he could actually throw fireballs but it's still the kind of thing where you kind of had to set up things and get your staff out and chant and focus in and like once every minute you could throw a fireball at something and to the to the point where he actually got very good at setting up ambushes to to be able to lay down some pretty heavy destruction even as long as you know, he was kind of like Batman, where you know, as long as he had prep time, you were fucked because he could fuck you up. Uh, hang on. But he also realized that if he were ever surprised, or if he were ever, if it was a situation where he couldn't prepare, he was in trouble because he wizards and thieves will do not act quickly. They can have stuff prepared like scrolls and shit like that, but it's still a sort of thing like you got to have time effort and money to where like if you want to bust out a spell on the fly you still got to put time into it you know so hang on my throat's getting dry so he very much recognized this weakness in his character which was a good thing i was like you know he's he actually wants to prepare so he also he spent a lot of time uh specializing in ranged weapons so like he he got a i think he got either a crossbow or throwing knives i can't remember i think it was actually throwing knives he wanted to be kind of this kind of a knife man where he was very quiet um and he also didn't want to look like a wizard because people target wizards which is also by the way if you're ever uh playing a wizard um a smart dm will always target wizards first especially at high levels because if you're obviously a wizard anyone with any kind of intelligence knows that you are the guy who dishes out pain and dishes out pain in like a, a wide area of effect so don't be the kind of wizard who dresses like fucking Gandalf because they're going to hone in on you and hone in on you hard. If you're playing a wizard, this is what I always do. Dress like you're a thief. Dress you don't have to wear heavy armor, but dress like don't dress like a wizard. Don't wear a fucking robe. Don't wear a fucking pointy hat because at least you can say like if the DM unfairly targets you, you can get a point like I don't really carry anything that makes me like if you carry a staff it's kind of a giveaway, but that's why you don't always carry a staff. You know, you. I always just did a thing where I either I almost always would always have a wizard who just carried a sword. He didn't know how to use it, but he carried it. Or I would just have a guy who carried a cudgel, uh, a club, essentially. Or or I would carry a short sword or a pair of knives. Or I'd even just just dress like a normal guy, like a farmer or something like that, where I could have a staff, but it was like a, it looked like a pitchfork or something like that. So um. So, and that's also, it's, it's also a good thing to where you don't necessarily, if, as long as you're laying low, you're not necessarily known as the guy who throws fireballs, because that's always the kind of guy people remember. So, like, if you're, if you're the kind of adventuring party who causes crimes, you know, people are always going to remember the guy in the sky blue cloak raining fire down from the heavens. They're not necessarily going to know the guy who just kind of dresses in kind of leather armor. Uh, you know, hiding behind a barrel as the guy throwing the fire. And, you know, they might see the magic rating from his hand, but he's going to be much less, much more nondescript, you know what I mean? So I was actually very impressed with Martin's ability to to kind of play this guy who laid low, didn't make clear his his nature, you know. He he was just kind of looked like a guy, you know. Just kind of, he, he, just, he just said he was a mercenary, you know. He, he, had a, he had, like, a shield strapped to his back, mainly to stop people from stabbing him in the back. Um... And he carried, a, he carried like, a short sword. You know, that was his thing. But he, he didn't know how to use it, but he carried it. And so his big thing was, I want to still be, f- like, I, I want to, um, I still want to throw fire. He's like, he had this thing where, like, he wanted to throw fire a lot. And so he's like, well, I'm going to take skill in, like, alchemy. And I'm going to know how to do this shit. And so uh, at his, at low level, the, really the only things you can do with alchemy are just kind of create, and especially in Thieves' because there's not a whole lot of stuff you can do with it. But he's like, I'm going to create, like, a Greek fire, alchemist fire, and acid. So, like, that was what he could do, is he spent most of his off time writing scrolls and creating flasks of acid. 
So uh, his big thing was he just, as long, if, if it wasn't one-on-one, -on -one, he was crowd control. And so he still wanted to be crowd control in fights. So his thing was, if they were running around and he got ambushed, he would throw grenade weapons. And grenade weapons, by, by I don't mean actual grenades, but they, that's what they call anything with like a flask that you throw. So he would throw either Greek fire or, or uh, acid. And if you stop to think about that, that's, that's, it's, it's really sick, actually, if, if you think about that. Where you think, about, think about that. A guy who throws acid at you, that's fucked up, right? So, like, uh, you know, you wouldn't want to fuck with this guy. Like, this guy, seriously, a guy with this, you'd be less afraid of, a, of the big fucker with a sword. Like, the guy with a sword, he might stab you, okay? You might live. But this guy throws fucking acid at you. Fuck me, man. That's that's gross. So like, that's, that's just cold. You don't do that. Shit. That's like that's like against the rules. <laughs> you don't throw acid at a motherfucker. So like, okay. But that was his thing, where he would carry. He would like the, have like this fucking bandolier of of flasks of acid and and Greek fire, and he would have like flint and it would fucking Molotov cocktails. Yeah, he'd also carry Molotov cocktails. This guy, this guy was a fucking pyro. And that was kind of his gimmick. Um, the worst character was really uh, was a uh, uh, let's call him Kenny. Kenny, uh, he he played this cleric of the god of death, and um, I think there's a lot of characters like this in in uh, in RPGs who who want to play. I've had this so many times, where uh, they always want to play a character who follows the god of death. To where, like, uh, the the latest, in 4th edition D&D, there's the Raven Queen. And the first thing I got when I played a 4th edition game was, um, I want to be a paladin of the Raven Queen. A paladin of the Goddess of Death. And I'm like, uh, okay, you can justify it, but that's kind of grim. So, like, you know, you've got this character who's always another really broody character who's like, I facilitate the passing of souls to the grave, for we all die, and that is my mission. Jesus it's I hate that character. So his character was always this guy who was just like, if there was a plague, he would want to go visit the plague and like pray at it, and like he like his eyes would light up if there was ever a stack of bodies somewhere. Like oh, there was a fire in the lower quarter. There's bodies stacked in the streets. He'd be like ooh, and he'd run off and he'd go. Be, he'd be like he'd be like. Oh, goddess of death, praise be to thee. You have brought death to these believers. I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ, this fucking guy. And everyone else would kind of shake their head. But he like, but you know what? He heals people. So we'll keep him. But even then, he would be kind of this guy where like, okay, I'll heal you, but you have to say this prayer to the god of death. And we'd be like, I pledge allegiance to the reaper. You know, like, <laughs> this guy, I hated Kenny. But, um, so, uh, Martin. Okay, so we did this thing. We ran this campaign, and the setup was these guys were just travelers on the way to Sanctuary. And what happens in, in Sanctuary is they all get robbed. Like, they, they're, they're aware that Sanctuary is dangerous, but they had no idea. Because mainly what happens is, as soon as they get in the, into the city, uh, they get stopped by city guards. Like, 20 of them. And the city guards completely rob them blind like there's a fight but they're first level and so they just get trounced they take their shit and they're like no get the fuck out of here so these guys are, are just pounded into the ground and so i start off the campaign by basically stripping them of all their gear which is kind of a dick move on my part but this is this was the point you know i was i wanted to drive home early on that these guys have no friends in this city and I kind of told them from the beginning, it's going to start this way. So it wasn't really surprising to them. So you might think, oh, Spoonie's a dick. Now I was like, you guys are going to start off in a really dark situation just so I can, I want to, I want to see how you guys handle it when you kind of start at the very bottom of the barrel with no resources. And so, um, I basically strip all these guys of all their gear. And so they're, they're, they were, they're part of like a merchant caravan. Even the merchants get robbed. And so I was like, these guards are fucking assholes. So these guys are are stuck in the lower quarter with no weapon. They, like there was one guy who managed to he 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 set out by saying um like he managed to conceal a knife on himself that they didn't steal, and there was a guy who who managed to to uh, he had uh, like a hidden compartment in his boot where he had like three gold pieces and I'm like so okay all you've got is a knife and three gold pieces what are you guys gonna do 
And so this was how I really kind of injected them into Thieves' world by saying, you guys aren't necessarily heroes. You're not evil, but, you know, you're in this really tough situation, so you got to do what you got to do to eat. So, you know, these guys essentially kind of went... Um, <laughs> the first thing they asked was... They, they asked Matthew, like, uh, could you... could you uh, Maybe we can go into the, to the wealthier quarter and you could... Uh, you could pickpocket people, and Matthew's like, "I'm not that kind of thief." <laughs> so like, I don't know what he did. Uh, uh, so, es- essentially, what they did was they they lured a city guard uh, into an alley. Like they like, "Oh, help, help! I'm being attacked!" And the guards like, "I don't fucking care." So, but like they 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 eventually lured this guard by saying, "There's someone hurt! There's someone hurt!" And so the guy the, the guard is essentially going to rob this guy. So they lured this guy into the alley and they shank him. And so. They kill this guard. They just beat the shit out of this guy and kill him. And so they take the guardsman's armor and they have the thief, Matthew, they have Matthew dress in the armor. And they're like, "Can you can you disguise yourself?" And he's like, "I think so. I'm, I'm not that kind of thief, but I, I have charisma." So, so like they dress him up, and so he kind of sneaks into the guards' barracks and he steals some stuff back. You know, he he steals enough stuff where they can they sell it they sell it and they they have at least food for the night. And so. They go to the vulgar unicorn, which is which is like the popular tavern from the novels, and they start to get some work. So they get some work, and they start to you know the first couple weeks of them kind of taking very simple jobs, you know, like very simple uh, events that 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 give them some money, and they they kind of scrape together. A, they get a, they get a place to live, which is essentially like like a one room flop house. They're all stuck in this shithole, and that's where you know Brendan's like you know if it, with with a with a little bit of investment I can create some weapons and we can really start to even the playing field here where people won't want to fuck with us because we're kind of the new blood in this city and so it was not only about you know eating but also establishing a reputation you know establishing this reputation where we are not to be fucked with cuz we will fucking end you it, it, was, it was kind of about almost like forming a gang so they they quickly kind of developed into this gang mentality to where they had a they had a reputation to uphold to where you you didn't want to get fucked with, so it was. I, I really dug this game, and they were really digging it too. Because I started them off by getting by kicking their asses and stealing everything they had. They weren't that attached to it because again they were just starting out. But they they kind of dug the unconventional opening to this thing, and so they also kind of dug the fact that they had to really start from square one, and they they kind of had to do some shady things in order to to get moving. And so you had this really great game. And so what happened was uh, they get contacted by uh, the city guard. Uh, and so they're, they, they, uh, the city guard's looking for them. So the, some of the city guards go in there and they're like, we're looking for these guys. You know, they, they list off their names. And the, the bartender likes the, parties, the party now. So they get, he's like, what's this about? Are they in trouble? Are they wanted for anything? And they're like, and the city guardsman is like, no, no. In fact... We, uh, you know, we, we have some work for them. And so they're like, oh, geez. So th- that was actually kind of this thing where uh, they didn't trust the city guard as far as they could kick them because the last time that happened, the guard kicked the shit out of them. And so they actually kind of followed this guardsman around to see what was up. And so eventually they follow. Th- th- it was very smart. They scouted it out. You know, they, they were learning very quickly. They could have been walking right into a trap. So, in fact, I kind of expected them to just be like, well, let's hear them out. No, no, they wanted to, to investigate this. And so they kind of went off on their own thing. They, they, uh, they did not do what I expected, but they did something better. They are like, we're going to follow this guard. Essentially, they told the guard no. And so they follow the guard, and the guard goes back to the royal palace. And so they sneak past the guards which was actually very tense, very exciting. And so they go back there, and they, the guy, you know, one of them climbs up the wall. Not Matthew, because not, he's not that kind of thief. So one of them kind of climbs up the wall, and he sneaks in the window. And the guardsman reports back, and they look in there, and it's, it's Tempest Thales. And so the guard says, they wouldn't, they, they refused your offer, my lord. And so Tempest is like, well, shit. So, he, so Tempest is like, and he, Tempest is like, well, why not? And it's like, well, they don't, they, don't, they don't trust us. And he's like, well, I don't blame them. How about this? Um, so, and they're like, why not? And so the guard comes, you know, they kind of play, they kind of play messenger tag for a little bit. And so eventually the, the guard's like, well, why don't you want to come meet us? We'll, we'll pay you if you want. And they're like, we don't want to, the last time we came into the city, we got fucking mugged by these fucking guards at the gate. And so the guardsman's like, okay, okay. So he goes back and the next day, all of the guards who robbed them are dead in the street in front of the in in front of the uh, the tavern, 
And so the, the PCs are like, oh, shit. So they kind of, you know, they're like, so they they rob the guards, the, the dead guardsmen blind, and they're like, this guy, he just fucking killed his own men. This must be really important. And so they're like, well, they, they, they didn't know, they knew it was nothing good, but they knew at least that this guy was not leading them to a trap, because he just fucking murdered 20 of his own men, and there was no, like, the guardsmen d- weren't touching it. You know, like, they, there was no investigation to this, and so they were really intrigued by this Tempest guy. And of course the guy, there was one guy, um, James, who, who had read the books and didn't trust Tempest Thales as far as he could kick him at all. And so, um, so he's like, he's like, I've, so he's kind of using out of knowledge. He had, he had knowledge local and knowledge history. And so he's like, he's he like rolls and he's like, well, I've heard of this Tempest Thales guy. He is bad news. We do not want to fuck with this guy. And they're like, we're not going to fuck with him. We're just going to talk to him. He must, he must want something. He killed 20 men. Like, to, to get to talk to us. And he's like, okay. So they go there, and Tempest, he's like, look, I need some people that uh, that aren't from this town. And you guys are definitely not from this town. And they're like, yeah, yeah, go on. And she's like, he's like, as you can tell, we've got some bad apples in the city. You know, he's we've got some guardsmen who are not following my rules, and that pisses me off. And, you know, it's like, I gotta thank you for pointing out those guys at the gate, because... Their behavior was not authorized by me or anyone else. He's like, he gives them all their stuff back. He's like, you know, this may not be all your stuff, but I did what I could. I got, I got most of it back because, for uh, I, 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 uh, I took them down into the dungeons and I made them talk. And he's like, I got everything I could back, stuff they didn't sell, and hell, you can have the rest of their stuff because their families aren't going to need it. So all of a sudden they got all this shit, and they're like, okay, Mister Thales, what do you want? He's like. He's like, I'm not asking you to work for me because I know you guys don't like the Rankins very much. I'm not asking you to do that. All I'm asking you to do is there's this uh, there's this new shop that opened up in the lower quarter. I just want you to go in there and look. Because some of my guys are going in there, some of them aren't coming out, and some of them are coming out and they're acting very differently. And so he's it's like, and like, what do we get out of this? And he's like, well, you walk out of this room alive... And they're like, oh, really? And he's like, yeah, really. But, um, so I had them roll charisma checks. And he's like, yeah, really. But if you want, I'll pay you, you know, X amount of gold pieces each. And like 100 gold pieces each. Uh, And he's like, and um, I'll pardon you for the murders of the 20 guards outside. Because I could easily just pin this on you. And so they're like, you know, he's like, which do you want? The Do you want the honey or the vinegar here? Because... I'm being nice right now, and I'm only going to ask nice once. So they're like, oh, be nice, be nice, we'll be nice. And so they're like, they go outside, and they're immediately like, how do we fuck this guy? How do we fuck over Tempest Thales? We're like, well, we can't right now, but let's do this thing, because we really need the money. I I put them in this position where they really fucking need the money, because they also have to pay protection to this gang, because this gang is huge. So anyway, um, they do this thing, and they go into this this shop. There's this there's this store in the lower quarter that just appeared one day. And if you've read the books, you're familiar with the store, but I changed it a little bit. So where these people are walking into the store, and it's very strange. Some of them are walking out with magic items. You know, like really strange magic items. Some of them aren't walking out at all. Some of them are walking out acting very differently than they walked in. So they go in there, they sneak in, and... They go into the basement. This place has a shockingly deep basement. And what happens is they find that there's this... At the bottom of this place is there's this cult. And it's it's basically Cthulhu, a cult of Cthulhu, but not quite. So they go down there and they find these people are... You know, they're... um, They're giving people... They're either taking them for sacrifices, they're brainwashing them, or... They're giving them these cursed magic items, which are very powerful. They're basically like weapons. So, like, one guy will walk out with a with a magic wand that will throw, like, fire at command. But it's almost like one of the, the rings that turn you into a Nazgul. The more you use it, the more corrupted you are by this evil influence. And so, um, you kind of had these gang wars breaking out in the city... So I had this thing where they were they were kind of fighting thugs who had these magic weapons, and they were collecting these magic weapons, but they were very shady because the wizard was looking at this stuff going, this is no, like no kind of magic I've ever seen before. There's something off about it. And they're like, there's something off about every kind of magic. And, you know, and, and, and Martin's like, no, you don't get it. This is really weird. So they go down there and they find this cult. 
and so they uh, over the course, you know, they, they they have to they go in and out of there, and they find this cult, and eventually they decide like like we got to put a stop to this because they, like we're they're gonna burn the fucking city down, they're gonna cause this war in the city because everyone's getting these like free magic items, people are coming out of there like fucking they like people are walking out with with psionic powers, almost like fucking Tetsuo. You know, like, this guy's... There's this guy they had to deal with who could basically crush a house with his mind and stuff. So this is fucking weird, so we gotta stop this. And so they they go back, they retreat out of there, and they start putting this plan together, like the fucking A-team, and I'm loving it, because they're doing this thing where they, they go in there and they map out this this store and all the levels beneath it, and they very cleverly did it, so they had to kill guardian monsters, but they actually hid the body, so they weren't gonna be found. But, like, we have to do this fast, because... We've only got let they 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 like, we got like eight hours before they find these bodies. You no, know, like we we they put basically put them in a pantry and spike the door shut. Um, but they're like they they're like we can't we can't bust up this cult because we're outnumbered like fucking four to one down there. There's these guys. There's these fucking psionic dudes. We're we're fucked if we just rush in there. So like we go back. They start planning things out, and so they start planning like they get this map out, and they're like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna surround them like this, and on this command. The mage is gonna throw something into the fire that's gonna cause smoke. Can you do something like that? And he's he, like he goes, can I? He's like, can I make a spell that causes smoke, like like obscuring mist almost? And so I go, yeah, I'd like start doing spell. I'm like, I'm digging this. They're working like a well-oiled machine. I'm loving it. So they do this thing where they're gonna make mist. The, the they're gonna they're all gonna take some alchemist fire. They're gonna hit the they're gonna hit the guys who are obviously in charge. They're gonna try to murder as many of the obvious spellcasters as they could. So they did this thing where they're like, you know, the, the this was all predicated on the fact. That, and I think I forget how they knew this, but they knew this ritual was gonna go on for some time. I think it was because, like, uh, they were. Yeah, oh, I remember. Um, they were planning, they, they, when they arrived, the cultists were, like, all talking about something about, like, the summer solstice, or something like that, where, like, they were planning this huge ritual to, to culminate at the solstice. And so the wizard's like, that's in, like, ten hours. And so they go, well, they're gonna be chanting until then, right? So, like, yeah. So they planned this hit, they, they, like, this hit out. And so it was brilliant. I mean, these guys were, like, planning this huge fucking murder fest, to like the last detail they had contingency plans they had like well what if one of us drops you know like what if one of us can't get the well we'll do this so so they they fucking do this thing they sneak around there and matthew's still going like uh, like throw things i'm not gonna kind of thief. but like i can stab people and like good stab this guy and stab him more until he stops moving he's like i can do that so i'm getting to a point i really am so they do this thing where they, they plan this out. They go back in there and sneak in there. And I got this whole fight planned out. This is fucking brilliant. I actually didn't think they'd do it. I actually thought they would just... Honestly, most of, most of the thing... I actually thought they'd just go back to Tempest and be like, there's a fucking cult down there. You gotta stop. Like, t- like go report back to Tempest. And, like, the, the they just kind of be like... I thought they would stick to the letter of the intent where he just kind of said, like, go scout it out. Right? So, but they didn't scout it out. They wanted to stop it. They, like they wanted to. Uh, they they actually, for some reason, had a sense of nobility about them. And mostly, I think they were itching for a really good fight. And the notion that I kept hinting that if they uh, there was a lot of really cool stuff down there, and if they if they took it themselves, they would have first crack at the loot. So I think that I think greed kind of motivated that more than anything because you know I, I I went into great detail about how the guy leading the cult ceremony was like wearing all this gold he had like gold rings and like a silver necklace and he had this really exquisite looking serpentine style sword and and shit like that so I, I think it was more motivated by greed because they're like we're not letting Tempest have this shit we can do this like like I think that was I think that was it I think it was like I think it was like James was like you know what we can fucking do this and so I was like okay. If you want to, because I was just kind of expecting them to go to Tempest and have Tempest bust up the ring, and I'd give them, you know, I'd give them story completion XPs, but I gave them this option. So they go down there, and they have a really great fight. It was close. Like it wasn't the sort of thing where the, all the roles went their way. It was really close, but they worked together as a team, and they killed fucking everybody in that cult. And so. I'm like, uh, when the fight's over, the smoke is cleared, they bust up this ceremony, they even bust up this Cthuloid monster 
that kind of came through, like, the when they bust up the ceremony, the, the head priest is like, you fool! You've disrupted everything! Ah! And he falls down, this this weird amorphous blob comes out, and they fucking kill that, too. It was a tough monster, too. So they go down there, and I'm like, okay, you guys just enacted, like, fucking World War Three down here? Or what? You know, I was like, you, cause, you guys caused a fucking racket. And you can already hear outside, like... There is a commotion because this house is starting to, you know, there's, you can hear a commotion outside. So you don't have long, um, before the guards arrive. Actually, I don't think I, no, I didn't even say that. I was like, you can hear a commotion outside because you guys, yeah, I say, yeah, I said, there's a commotion outside because you guys made a shitload of noise. You don't know what's coming. You don't, I was like, oh, okay. I know what you said. I, I know. Um, I said, you don't know. You, I said, you've cleared this room, but you don't know that there's not more coming. That's, that's what I said. Because you hear a commotion outside. You don't know what it is. And it's like, we got to move fast because we're beat up. So they're, they're, so the one guy's watching the door. There's only one door in, in and out of here. And they're like, we need to find another way out of here. So they set, they set one guy looking for a secret passage. Because there's always a secret passage in these ritual chambers, right? The other guys are, like, scooping all the loot they can. They're like, we don't care if it's cursed. Just scoop. We'll figure it out later. So they they, got the, they, they actually bought burlap sacks in preparation for this. like, shh, shh, shh. So they go in there, and eventually they pull the guy off the door. Like, they have one guy, like, bar the fucking door. They're like, you know what, Matthew? Shove a crowbar in the fucking door. And, we'll, you know, they, they bar the door and, like, just get more shit. We gotta get out of here. So the um, they, they start scooping shit into a bag, and I say, I start rolling dice to see what's coming. And so, like, I start rolling dice, and they're getting really nervous. And so they're like, I, I say, you hear, a, you hear a pounding at the door. And they're like, shit! So, um, I say, well, and, and finally Matthew goes, I found a secret door. Cause there's always one. Um, so they're, they're like, great, great. We're almost done here. We've only got the, the, the one guy to search. And so I'm like, the, the, the kicking at the door grows more and more intense. And so the, um, <laughs> I'm not sure how to say this. Uh, I'm trying to think of the funniest way possible to describe what's about to happen. Okay. So. This is, I'm going to say exactly what happens as I said it. I say, the, the pounding at the door grows more and more intense. Suddenly, with one final crashing impact, the door is violently kicked aside. The doors fly open. The crowbar spreading. And inside, I get cut off. Um, Martin, I almost said it earlier, Martin cuts me off and says I hurl a flask of acid at his face now what was supposed to happen was Tempest Thales was supposed to swoop in with his with his detachment of guards and you know just in the nick of time right to save these guys that that was actually the, my plan was if they were starting to lose the fight that I was going to kind of fudge it and have Tempest kind of come in and, and kind of do mop-up duty so they wouldn't all get slaughtered, because I thought they might. But Tempest Thales was going to swoop in, um, claim all the credit, and essentially stiff them on the payment, but let them live. You know what I mean? So, like, he was going to be like, thanks for doing all my work for me, douchebags. I'm going to take, you know... But, yeah, Tempest was going to do this thing where he was just going to walk in in the nick of time and save them and so he was gonna walk in and go good guy get the fuck out of here you know so the fucking martin he goes i hurl acid at the door before i could manage to say and tempest thales and his troops walk in the room so i go i, I think everyone at the table was like no um so i i he he doesn't even wait for me to finish. He goes, I hurl a flask of acid at the door. And then he rolls his dice. So he, I'm like, I, I was almost going to say, are you sure? But he rolled dice and he was fucking committed. So he rolls a crit. He rolls a 20. So I'm like, roll again. Because in third edition, you have to confirm your crit. And he rolls like an 18. So I kind of put my head down for a minute. I'm like, oh, oh no. Mm. <laughs> so I put my head up and I kind of finish and I go, 
as Tempest fails and a squad of six guardsmen enter the room, a flask of acid crashes into his face! (laughs) And I was even going to cut him some slack before I was like, you know, Tempest is really hard to hit because he's essentially the god of war. But you're only... So... Tempest gets a flask of acid crashing into his face. And I'm like, you do max damage. In fact, you do double damage. I was like, the two guardsmen on either side of him get splashed with the acid, and they go down clutching their face. The guardsmen draw their swords, and Tempest, like, shrieks in in surprise and pain. Because that was the fucking last thing even Tempest Thales was fucking expecting. Was to get fucking acid thrown in his face! And this was in, you know, honestly, this was in no danger of killing him. Because, honestly, acid does not do that much damage in the grand scheme of things. Certainly not to Tempest Thales. But, it was a flask of acid in the face. So, I'm like, I'm like, Tempest, like, clutches at his face, just fucking shriek, like, ah! ah!" And so, they, they... like the party, as soon as I say the words Tempest Thales, white, even Brendan, uh, shit, I said his name, um, Brendan, um, even, even Brendan, I, you knew I was going to fuck it up. Even Brendan was like, I thought it was cultists. And we're like, obviously fucking not. <laughs> fuck. I can't believe I fucked it up. Brendan. Is Brendan. So. So, as soon as I say the words Tempest Thale, white as a sheet, they're like, oh shit. And they all like, they, they all like part the seas away from, they're like, you shouldn't have done that. <sighs> so they're like, they run. They fucking, they smart, they fucking run. So what was supposed to happen was that Tempest Thales was kind of developing a grudging respect for them. Like, he was, he still kind of screwed them over on the payment, but it was going to be like, he kind of liked these guys because they got job done. And so, like, every now and then, he would kind of throw them a bone, you know. They, they, they wouldn't be working for him, but there was, there was a plan in motion here to where, like, eventually Tempest was going to kind of use these guys and offer to help pay them to maybe overthrow the city and put them in positions of power, you know. So, like, he was going to be kind of not necessarily working for him, but... But he was going to put them in motion into greater things. Like, there was going to be a greater campaign involved, and Tempest was kind of going to be the guy giving them the option to kind of work for him for a little bit, you know. That's out the window! Because you just threw fucking acid in his face! So, fucking Brendan... God damn. So, they, they run. They fucking flee. And so, now I'm thinking, okay, oh, shit. My whole fucking campaign is dead. Because they just threw acid in his face. And I'm like, uh, and so this is where I'm kind of going like, there, there's there's by the rules, and then there's what should happen. Bottom line, here's what happened. Tempest, Tempest, really he just took like nine points of damage, which for him is nothing, really. But if you think about this, in any kind of like real world scenario or even in any kind of movie it's a flask of acid to the face so like i'm thinking like well i could do this one of two ways i could do this where like really it's nothing to tempest thales he goes off he's pissed but he heals because he's a god you know he's essentially a, a god um so I'm, I'm thinking of this one of two ways like, he goes, well, it's no big deal. They're stupid. They fucking threw acid in my face. But you know what? It's nine points. It's nothing. Or, and I eventually started thinking of this. I was like, you know, this is this is a really bad situation if you, if you stop thinking. Like, there's no way. Like, how do I put this? Okay. Let's say, let's say you take a 20th level fighter. Okay, and he's got an absurd amount of hit points. He's got let's say he's got like three hundred hit points. He's got you know an eighteen constitution. He's got all these hit points. But let's say you put him in a situation where 
you have him, you have him dead to rights. Let's say an assassin is like he he surprises him in bed. He's got a knife at his fucking jugular, and he's like, "If you move, I'm gonna kill you." And the twentieth level fighter says something stupid or tries to resist and pisses him off because in metagame he knows that a dagger only does like one to four points of damage okay so he's like so in his thinking in game thinking he's like four damage to me is nothing right because i have like 300 hit points so you could think of it that way or you could think of it like it doesn't matter how many hit points you have the dude has a dagger literally at your jugular if he stabs you with this you're dead you know what i mean so there's kind of a game way of thinking and a real life way of thinking about this and so i started kind of thinking like well either he thinks about it like it's just nine hit points it's nothing or i go dude took a flask of acid in the face you know to where like there's no good way to take that you know there's you don't just go like oh that's nine hit points yeah nothing especially since we're dealing with this kind of dark and gritty world where magic is not the end-all cure-all to all things like even if you take a sword wound and thieves roll and you get it magically healed you're probably still gonna have a pretty vicious scar you know what i mean in fact i think there's rules for like permanent maiming and wounds so, like if you take a critical hit in thieves world and it's it doesn't heal properly you take penalties you get like either a scar you get some kind of there's a lasting impact there's a wound or something like that you you know you lose five if you, if you take a crit to the to the leg, you know, you, you take five points, you, you lose five feet off your speed, so it goes from 30 to 25, let's say. So I start to think about this, and I go, I was like, they're so surprised, the, the guards are so surprised by this, Tempest is so stunned by this, A, that he got hit, B, that he got hit by a flask of acid to the face, and C, C that he got a flask of acid thrown in his face by the guys who's f- fucking working for him, so I'm like, you know what? You just get away. Because, like, they're so surprised, but they're like, ah! So, like, these guys are, like, worried about their commander. Like, this Tempest is like, ah, fucking, fucking assholes! Ah! And so, like, they're like, Lord Tempest, are you okay? And he's like, fucking, fucking, get you! <laughs> ah! Assholes! So, like, they close the secret door behind them and they fucking bar it. And they like, they're doing like Blues Brothers routine where they're throwing shit in front of the door. They're like, fucking Tempest is coming! So they, they get away. And so I'm like, okay. So either he just, he shrugs it off or I do this the way it would happen if you took a flask of fucking like, I can't even, I want to say sulfuric acid, but like, like really fucking potent alchemist acid in the face. Where I'm like, you'd be fucked up. You know, you'd be like that guy you'd be like that guy in alien resurrection when he gets like spit on he's like Aah! or like that dude in robocop where he's like Aah! he comes out of that toxic way he's like you'd be fucked up by that you'd be screwed up and so now here's the thing with tempest is again he's a god but he's also his healing his immortality comes from the uh the goddess of of you know rape murder and war so, but the thing is, he only gets that, he only gets those powers if he pleases the goddess, okay? Because there's instances in the book where he actually greatly displeases the goddess and his wounds don't heal as fast or like she'll withhold powers from him. And he like, so mainly it's his immortality and his healing where the goddess, she doesn't let him die, but she doesn't let him forget failure either. So, I start to think about this, and I'm like, ordinarily, this is the sort of thing that the goddess would just heal Tempest from in a day. But, think about this. Tempest just got fucking humiliated. Like, he walked in a door and fucking got douched with acid. And these guys basically, like, ran off laughing like they were stunned but they were like i can't believe we fucking did that to tempest <laughs> he's gonna fucking kill us you know? um so like th- let's just say this is one of those things where like tempest was humiliated and like let's just face it these second level guys first and second level guys just fucking humiliated tempest fails the fucking god of war like because this guy is basically impossible to hit like if these guys had tried to jump tempest 
it would have been humiliating. They wouldn't have been able to touch this guy unless the guy fucking critted him, which is like the only way it's going to happen. Like, it would have taken a miracle shot to hit this guy. And guess what? He got a miracle shot. You know, even if he were surprised, which he was, this guy's natural armor class is so good. And he's like, he's, he's so blessed by fucking this, this goddess that he's untouchable. But this guy, blind shot with acid, bam. So I'm like, you know what? The goddess is fucking pissed. Really fucking pissed. You don't do this. Like, you don't do this to my servant, to my fucking servant on this planet. Like, you do not fucking throw acid into my servant's face. You know what? I'm not healing this. Tempest, you're a fuck up. So, like, I kind of do this, I kind of do this little plot development in my head where, like, I'm thinking, like, Tempest goes back to his room. He's flipping shit over. He's like, oh, fuck, fuck. You know, he's, he's flipping, he's like, he's fucking scarred all over his face. You know, his face is fucking smoking. His eyelids are burned off. He's like, ah! And so he's like, he's like, he he prays to his guys. He's like, fucking, these fuck nuts. You know, like, fucking burn my face. Like, heal me so I can go kill these motherfuckers. Because, like, this is the kind of guy who does not take things like this lying down. And so I go, like, the goddess would go, like, no, no. And then Tep is like, what? And the guy's like, no, you got fucking owned. Tep is like, what? And the goddess is, says like, you're going to, I'm not going to heal you that shit. You go get them back. I'm not going to heal that until you get revenge, until you show them what it's like, you know, until you show them who you are, because that is not who you are. You know, you do not. What the fuck was that? You know, like this guy threw fucking ass at me and you just walked off like no no you you're not getting healed until you fix this until you fucking until you make this right until you make your name feared again because un- people are gonna be laughing at you you fix this and so like so they're like even the guys even like so the guys get back to the to the they, they're in hiding now because they're like they, they don't they can't go back to the vulgar unicorn yeah they can't go back to their normal hangout because they're like that's where the guy found us the last time we fuck so like they go back to their place and they pack up they leave they find another place somewhere in the bowels of the city and they're getting around like oh fuck tempest is gonna kill us and they're like well, wait a minute tempest is like a god he's not he'll heal so they're like they're very naive about this they're like no oh, he'll fucking he'll, shit. he'll be mad but he's, he's not gonna hire us again but he won't we did what he wanted and they're like, yeah, but our money. And he's like, fuck money. We got all this stuff from the from the cultists. We got this, we can sell this shit. And she's so like, well, won't he be looking for us to be fencing goods with this shit? And they're like, maybe we'll be. We're good at this. Matthew, you can fence stolen goods, right? Or, 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 or I keep saying their names. Oh, I know. I want to know. Matthew, that's a different guy's name. No, 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 Matthew. So they're like, Matthew, you can sell this shit, right? And it was like, I'm not that kind of thief. <laughs> he's like, don't you have streetwise? No. Streetwise? No, I'm not that kind of thing. No. So like, but they go, they go. You know what? This is not the end of the world, okay? Not the end of the world, because he'll heal. You know, I know enough about the books to know he, the, the motherfucker's immortal. He's fine. He'll be pissed, but he's not going to be coming after us. And even if he does, we'll fucking explain it. Because they're like, you know, they're actually kind of optimistic about this. Because they ran like they didn't want to be around him in the immediate hour after it happened. They're like. We'll give this guy a week. He'll cool down, okay? And I'm like, you don't know Tempest Thales very well, do you? And they're like, it's fine, you know? Um, so they decide to lay low for a couple weeks. And you kind of sit on their sit on their loot. And, and they're going to they're gonna see how this goes. But, and, but they're really not worried about Tempest. They're like, you know, we'll, just, we'll kind of wait till things blow over. But he'll heal. He'll heal. He doesn't heal. No. And I'm like, you know what? You kind of, and I'm kind of pissed off too, because I'm like, you fucked up my kid. With one fucking flask of, had you missed, I'd have been like, you know what? Tempest is like, oh, and he kind of dodges it, and some guy behind him gets fried, and Tempest is like, ha 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 ha, you asshole, you know. Um, but no, he had to hit. So, like, even if he had come close to hitting, like, even if he'd said, uh, you know, flask of acid to the face, and he just kind of, he didn't crit the guy, if he just hit, I'd have been like, it hits him in the chest, and he's like, ow. What was that? You know, but no, he had to crit him in the face. Um, so I'm like, this guy just got fucking embarrassed. 
So there's, uh, I'm trying to think of ways I can salvage this campaign where Tempest is still kind of contacting their jobs. I can't do it. I can't because now I've got this thing where Tempest is fucking scarred. He's fucking pissed, and he can't get his he can't get his healing factor back until he gets revenge. So uh, now now I'm starting to think on the fly. I'm starting to think like emergency mode. Like what do I do? Well, now I've got this thing where like okay okay we're gonna do a new campaign around this. Instead of Tempest being your benefactor, Tempest is now your, he's he's on you now. Because, like, so, the first thing that happens is that, um, uh, I, I'm still kind of going forward with several things that happen in the campaign where, like, certain historical events are still happening, but, like, I go, a week passes. And soon, all of the town criers are saying, uh, hear ye, hear ye, um, the Lord Tempest Thales has an announcement he wishes to make. You know, so everyone kind of gathers, he's like, all who wish to hear this announcement you know, please gather at the at the inner city wall, and he will address thee. And so these guys go, Tempest fails. Oh shit! Well, so they go and listen because they're like, this is obviously a, a campaign hook. So, and they're like, the crowd is gonna be so big because there's thousands of people in, in sanctuary. So they go down there and they all disguise themselves anyway. So they're in this crowd. They're like, nobody's gonna see us. So Tempest fails. He's he comes on there, kind of looking like you know uh, the guy from Assassin's Creed. He's got this hood on and. You know, um, the, the, the criers kind of hold their hands up for silence. Um, he's got crossbowmen all over the place, you know, kind of pointing down at the wall. So, so nobody throws shit at him because nobody likes Tempest. And so um, he's like, Tempest is kind of pacing back and forth on the wall. He's walking back and forth. He's got this hood over his face. He's, he's like, you can see him kind of talking to himself. And the party's like, oh, shit. Oh, shit. And so he's, he's, he's like this one of these things where he's like so fucking mad. He can't even like, I can't, I can't, I can't even do this thing. Bro. And so like, eventually he stops. He's like, some of you may be aware that, uh, I've been missing for a few days. He pulls his hood down and reveals like this fucking horrible, like two face. He looks like fucking two face. Except, like, way worse. Where it's like, you can actually kind of see, like, his skull through this burned-off fucking acid in his face. You can see his jawbone. He's like, ah, I don't know. And so he's like, the reason I've been missing is because there's some, uh, there's, there's some people who broke into the palace and did this to me! And so people are like, people are, so like I say, the crowd is kind of torn. Some people are like horrified, but like I say, women are like passing out from the horrific scarring this guy's cause. And, you know, there's some guys laughing and there's some guys going like, some guys who are trying to kiss up to the, you know, some guys who are loyal to the Rankins going boo and some are going yay. And so like, but the, you know, I say the reaction is mixed, but fucking Brendan, he's like, you know, he's like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. And so he's like, He's like, and I know exactly what these guys look like. And so the crowd, he's like, and he goes, shut up, shut up, all of you. So like everyone shuts up. And so the people who don't, some people are laughing. Like he orders crossbowmen to shoot them because he don't fucking care. So there's this huge scene where like people are dying and he's like, he's like, everyone shut up. And so he's like, here's the thing. He's like, I only want one of them. Just one. And so... He, uh, he holds up this flyer and it's got it's got Brendan's character's face on it and so uh, he's like I will give 5,000 gold pieces to the man who brings me this brings me this criminal alive if possible and he's like if, if you give him alive 10,000 that's an absurd amount of money and so all of a sudden people are like people shut up now it's cause like and he's like if you even have a word as to where he is, every tip as to his location, I'll give you a hundred. And so everyone's like, I know where he is. And so he's like, he's like, I'll have my clerk standing here. Talk to him. And so Brendan, all of a sudden the party members are looking at him now. And so they're like 5,000. And the other guy goes 10 if he's alive. And Brendan's like, wait, whoa. Whoa! Mm -hmm. And they're like, "What's wait? Whoa, whoa, whoa! Let's not talk about this here, okay?" And so they're like, "Okay, okay." So like they go back to their place. 
they're basically gonna screw they're basically gonna screw Brendan over and he's like wait 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 hey oh and he's like you were with me you 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 turn me and he's gonna you know this guy he's gonna kill you too right and they're like let's think about this now eventually they decide yeah he's probably right and so they but they start thinking like they're like you don't move they start thinking about this and they're like what if we what if we killed him <laughs> like right in front of his face like they're like what if we killed him and then like no that wouldn't work because then they wouldn't know where to send the money and they're like Th-. brendan's like thanks <laughs> thanks a lot you know and they're like shut up we're thinking about this and so of course the brood they're out they're like surrounding this guy like just we're thinking about this okay like no offense but that's a fucking lot of money and brendan's like yeah you're right <laughs> so 